Can you buy Everton Football Club? How much would it cost? Maybe through your charitable foundation, or think of us as the Alyssa's cookies of football. We're a bit <laughs> soggy, but with your brains. It would be, yeah, Mark Cuban butt, and then it would be just like Ted Lasso, right? Where they're just like sitting in a pub screaming and yelling, that dumb, get them the hell out of here. So you win. <laughs> I'll call you. Mark Cuban, you're a great American. My guest today is a serial entrepreneur who has walked some journey, a modern reincarnation of a mythological American story, son of a car upholsterer in Pittsburgh. He's become a Yunza billionaire, shark tank provocateur, NBA owner, referee scourge, and outspoken visionary. It is an incredible joy to welcome Mr. Mark Cuban. What's up, Raj? How you doing, buddy? Mark Cuban, what's the one thing fans don't understand about the mantle of sports ownership? How painful it is to lose. Losing is more painful than anybody imagines. There's nothing worse because the minute they step on the pitch, the minute they step on the court, no control whatsoever. And inside of you, you know what to do and you know what should happen and you know what you think was supposed to happen when you made all the decisions or approved all the decisions but they don't always work out that way. And my family won't even watch a game with me. It's not like I just sit there and just watch a game. Last night we had a game that we won and we're up 29 points in the fourth quarter and I'm still pacing around the house and my kids are just laughing at me. <laughs> what is the greatest life truth that you've learned as a sports owner that you didn't know before? I guess the biggest life truth is that it's not a regular business. Google can have the best quarter and make more money than any company in the history of companies, and nobody's throwing a parade. If Google doesn't close the deal, there's nobody who's walking out the office thinking this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. But with sports, that's what we do. With sports, I get requests, can my son or daughter who just horrifically died of cancer, can they be buried in a jersey from their favorite player? That doesn't happen with other businesses. I guess the great life truth about sports is how emotionally attached we get to it. And as an owner, you have to realize that I don't really own the team. The fans own the team. No one singing to Sergey Brin. You're getting sacked in the morning, sacked in the morning. Exactly. You have, however, proven to be one of the most creative, occasionally controversial, but big vision sports owners looking to other sports for ideas that can empower the NBA to evolve. There's been a lot of talk about the NBA instituting a second tournament, an in-season knockout, a bit like the FA Cup. And you are nay on that, right? Yeah, I don't like it at all because you can only have one goal. That guy back there, that goal guy next to the rugby ball, there's only one of those a year. Wait till you hear about the Carabao Cup, but you do like the idea of the NBA launching essentially an NBA World Cup. What yeah. do you imagine that'll look like? Like the football one, but without the Qatar bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, over the summer or after the regular season, right? And countries would play against countries. So Luka Doncic would play for Slovenia, Christoph Porzingis would play for Latvia, and you'd have that World Cup, and it would be amazing. But the problem is, we give our best players to the Olympics, and you can't do both and do it well. And so you would have to pull back on the Olympics like football does. What is it, 21 and under? 23 and under. And then just have our best players from every country play each other. The players get half the money. They would make a lot more money. It'd be a great TV deal for the NBA, as opposed to the Olympics where we get nothing. Oh, just if it is like the Football World Cup, we've got to get ready for Dirk Nowitzki to come out of retirement right? and win it. The Germans, they always bloody win it, Mark Cuban. But let's talk <laughs> about the status of football in the United States. We always joke on our show, Mark, that soccer is America's sport of the future, as it has been since 1972. We Americans <laughs> like the best. NBA, best league in the world. The NFL, obviously, best in the world. World Series is what we call the winners of our baseball league and there's no argument there but the best football is inarguably played in Europe MLS still receiving incredible franchise fees 325 million dollars paid for Charlotte FC in 2019 you're a savvy sports owner how do you assess that opportunity for a league that's down the list of the top ones in the world I mean it makes sense simply because it's growing the challenge is there's not a big TV deal there. 
So most of your revenues have got to come from advertising and sponsorship and in-stadium ticket revenues, but they're doing such a great job there. And so it takes time. Look, there was a point in time 40 years ago in 1980 where the NBA finals were not even on television. They were on tape delay. There was a point in time when we lost our deal because the ratings weren't big enough and we had to make changes. It's like when I first got to the Mavs and people wouldn't show up at all because we were so bad, I used to give away free drinks. After the Mavs game, first $3,000 of beer are on me. And, you know, people might come the fourth quarter, but attendance went up. And, you know, we used to have concerts at halftime and after the game because I didn't care how they got there. I just wanted them to get there, see that I could make it fun and that the experience is fun because regardless of which sport, the idea that you can just stand up and scream at the top of your lungs and chant songs and if you're old enough, have a drink, that's a unique experience that you can't get anywhere else other than sports. And if it means I have to throw a concert or give away free alcohol to get you there to experience it, knowing that the next time through you'll pay and become a customer, then it's worth it. The pathway to American glory as an owner, free drinks. <laughs> One of the fascinating dynamics of the last decade has been the upsurge of American sports entrepreneurs buying into the Premier League. Eight of the 20 Premier League clubs have some American ownership right now. You were linked by the rumour mill and the football rumour mill. Well, it's never right, but I do love it. To buying Aston Villa in 2014, a link you rubbished. Have you ever sniffed around an English football club opportunity? No, if my heart's not in it, then it's just not right to the fans. If I don't eat, sleep and breathe every minute of it, even now, like I said, we're up 29 points in the fourth quarter and I'm still nervous. <laughs> That's how I am. I get nervous all day. My family can't be around me. And having to fly over the pond... I would be a wreck. And particularly since I don't know the sport that well, having to learn it all and get to know everybody, I just don't think I could do a great job. Daddy's going to get on his plane now and fly 12 hours so he can get really upset <laughs> at his English Premier League football club. The thing they all fear, Mark, is relegation. You know, if someone pitched the concept of relegation to you on Shark Tank, the idea of, let's say, the Magic or the Rockets being shoved down into the G League and the Rio Grand Vipers or the Wisconsin Herd replacing them, how would you react? I think it'd be interesting. I think it really would. Would you ever sleep at night if the threat of a bad season meant you'd be vanquished to the minus? Yeah, because it'd be the same. I can't feel any worse when we lose. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. In terms of non-family things, that's as bad as it gets. Jurgen Klopp says football is the most important, least important thing. Yeah, it's 100% true. That is the best way to put it. In the big scheme of things of life and death and family and all the things we face, it's a game. But because life is so hard in so many ways and we all face so much stress and anxiety in so many ways, it's the best release that there is. And it's the one place we all get to come together and no matter what we think about Brexit or pandemic or vaccinations, you're a Mavs fan, you're an Everton fan, you're one, right? You're together. And that's what makes it special. And the biggest challenge we have in the States is because of all the social media, and this is probably starting to happen in the UK and Europe as well, it's not so much a family thing anymore. Kids have the players they're fans of. They see Messi on TikTok and all the fun stuff, right? And that's who they become fans of, as opposed to the whole family is getting together to watch that game no matter what, or hell is freezing over. And that's starting to change across all sports, and that's our biggest challenge. You know, you've just hit it. The joy of it is the collective memories that are forged across generations. I'm stealing that line. That is a good line. The collective memories forged across generations. That is awesome. I'm glad I thought of it. That's going on the Dallas Mavs season ticket renewal direct mailers right now. But it is, it's transforming that in every regard. That ultimately, what you're saying is we just evolve. We just have to learn to evolve. My 12-year-old, rather than sitting down and watching a Mavs game, he's just going to wait for the highlights to come to TikTok and then just scroll right through them and see all the other highlights he likes too. And he's going to watch more basketball. He's going to be a bigger fan of basketball, but it's not going to translate to the traditional way of watching the sport. And so that creates a variety of things that we have to overcome. And that's one of the projects that I'm looking at. In a TikTok-like way, how do you send a game to a kid who wants to watch it in short bites as opposed to hearing the commentators 
just talk about the game for 90 minutes, in your case, in 48 playing minutes in ours. NWSL, the Women's Soccer League, coming off a season of some challenge, but it also delivered eye-popping ratings for the final. Can you forecast the growth of women's professional sports leagues in this country? the NWSL, the WNBA. Yeah, I think they're going to continue to grow and do well. I mean, you see some of the attendance that they got to games and the TV ratings that they got. And to me, that's a reflection that more and more kids, boys and girls, are growing up watching women's sports. So if you go to a high school soccer match or even a middle school soccer match or basketball game, you're going to see boys and girls there, right? It's not just one gender supporting that gender. And so as more and more people just become fans of the sport and appreciate the talent from the women that are playing, regardless of which sport, you're going to get a bigger and bigger fan base. Last question for you, Mark. Can you buy Everton Football Club? How much would it cost? maybe through your charitable foundation arm. Think of us as the Alyssa's cookies of football. We're a bit <laughs> soggy, but with your brains. It would be, yeah, Mark Cuban butt. And then it would be just like Ted Lasso, right? Where they're just like sitting in a pub, screaming and yelling, that dumb, get them the hell out of here. So you win. <laughs> I'll call you. Mark Cuban, you're a great American. 